Hi, my name is Virginia Schaefer. I'm at Emory in Atlanta. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today on abdominal pain and diverticulosis, SUD, SCAD, and smoldering diverticulitis. I have nothing to disclose. Abdominal pain is a common symptom that leads to millions of outpatient visits and visits to the emergency room. Surveys have routinely identified abdominal pain as the most common symptom prompting someone to seek medical care. Abdominal pain is a symptom of the top four most common diagnoses admitted for GI complaints, gallstones, acute pancreatitis, acute appendicitis, and diverticulitis. We often see abdominal pain and diverticulitis go hand in hand. And diverticulitis costs more than $2 billion in the US alone. So what do we know about diverticular disease? What do we know? We tell people that diverticulosis needs to be present for diverticulitis to occur. We say it's common in developed nations. We say that its prevalence is 1 to 2% under age 30, and that prevalence goes up with age, 50 to 66% as you get older. We also say that 10 to 25% of those with diverticulosis will develop diverticulitis. However, straight and all looked at patients with baseline asymptomatic diverticulosis and found on, found on screening colonoscopy and stratified by decade of life the cumulative diverticulitis probability over 130 months was 4.3%. And for every decade of life, there was a 24% lower risk of diverticulitis. Diverticulitis progression peaked at 11% for 40-year-olds. And so what is diverticulitis? Well, it looks something like this with these colonic outpouches, especially in the sigmoid colon. What causes it? Well, one answer is that the colon generates high pressures. These pressures lead to segmentation, which lead to herniation of the mucosa through the muscular defects where blood vessels penetrate. Painter, Trulov, and Ardrin published their paper about luminal pressures in 1965. Hughes did a large autopsy study and found thickened muscle layer corroborating the theory of high luminal pressures leading to thickened muscle. Berman and Morrison also published their paper around the same time, Berman in Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics, the predecessor to the Journal of the American College of Surgeons. This muscle thickening is a feature for many patients with diverticular disease. However, many patients do not exhibit this. Notice the years these studies were published. We've been telling patients the same thing for the last 50 years, but perhaps there's more to the story. Warner in 1958 hypothesized that patients should avoid foods which leave rough undigested particles in the stool. Bogardus wrote that the main culprit appeared to be inspissated food that leads to mucus secretions and trapping. Other theories include trapping of fecalis leading to inflammation. A survey in 1999 of almost 400 surgeons found that 68% recommended a low residue diet, 10% a high residue diet, 21% a regular diet, and 47% answered that avoidance of seeds and nuts may have some value. And so what do the studies actually show? This study in JAMA was a large prospective cohort study of 47,228 men as part of the health professionals follow-up study. At the beginning of the study, the men were free of diverticulosis, cancer, or inflammatory bowel disease. During the 18-year follow-up, there were 801 incident cases of diverticulitis and 383 incident cases of diverticular bleeding. Eating nuts and corn did not increase the risk of diverticulitis, and popcorn seemed to be somewhat protective. 
particular disease is multifaceted. And similar, like the blindfolded people feeling an elephant, we can focus on different facets of this condition at a time. So let's talk about how our understanding is evolving. We often think of diverticulitis as discrete, abrupt, and acute attacks. However, for some patients, this may not be true. Some may have chronic abdominal pain beyond flares and may also have IBS symptoms. SUD, symptomatic, uncomplicated diverticular disease in, in the absence of macroscopic inflammation, can be one of these entities. SCAD, which is segmental colitis associated with diverticulitis, can be another. So let's explore these entities. What is SCAD? It could be the Savannah College of Art and Design or spontaneous coronary artery dissection. But in this case, it means segmental colitis associated with diverticulosis. The endoscopic appearance of SCAD always shows inflammatory involvement of the interdiverticular mucosa with sparing of the peridiverticular mucosa, which may be involved only in cases of severe inflammation. In diverticulitis, there is typically involvement of the peridiverticular mucosa. SCAD inflammation may look quote unquote Crohn's like or ulcerative colitis like. SCAD shows active inflammatory infiltrate, often resembling UC. On the contrary, diverticulitis shows unspecific inflammatory infiltrate, sometimes active, but almost never similar to IBD. SCAD can bear resemblance to infectious and ischemic colitis. Histologically, SCAD can have cryptitis, crypt abscesses, even granulomas and chronic architectural distortion. Interestingly, approximately 10% of patients with SCAD can go on to develop frank IBD. SCAD patients tend to be older than IBD patients. They have rectum and proximal colon spared. UC affects the rectum, Crohn's can affect the whole GI tract. SCAD patients have lower risk of surgery than IBD patients and also have lower need for maintenance treatment. This is one proposed schematic for SCAD. As you can see, it is multifactorial, including mechanical factors such as mucosal prolapse, disturbed flora with increased exposure to toxins and antigens, as well as age, cardiovascular risk factors, and ischemia. All this culminating in inflammation leading to different types of SCAD. The different types present somewhat differently, but have in common the things I previously mentioned. The different types A, B, C, and D are beyond the scope of this talk, but there are excellent review articles on the differences. The next clinical entity to talk about is SUD, symptomatic uncomplicated diverticular disease. This is characterized by abdominal pain for at least 24 hours in the left lower quadrant. Persistent abdominal symptoms attributed to diverticula in the absence of macroscopically overt colitis or diverticulitis. Symptoms may overlap with IBS. A patient may be having abdominal pain from SUD or maybe they have IBS and diverticulosis. Tercy and all wish to answer whether left lower quadrant abdominal pain in a patient with diverticulosis is SUD or IBS. So they studied 72 consecutive patients suffering from recurrent abdominal pain and having colonic diverticulosis. They performed a colonoscopy and assessed the degree of diverticulosis according to the number of colon segments involved and diverticula per segment. After colonoscopy, they were subdivided into two groups based on pain characteristics and Rome 3 criteria. 
there were 42 SUD patients and 30 patients with IBS-like symptoms. And so then they looked at the fecal calprotectin levels and compared them to abdominal pain scores. The calprotectin test was positive in 27 or 64.3% of patients in the SUD group and zero in the IBS group. In patients with SUD, there was a significant correlation between the severity of the abdominal pain and fecal calprotectin score. Moderate to severe left lower abdominal pain was the best symptom which characterized SUD and differentiated it from IBS in this study. In the beginning, we thought of diverticular disease in more anatomical terms, high intraluminal pressures causing herniation at points of weakness, then mechanical obstruction or local trauma to diverticula leading to diverticulitis. Our thinking has changed to take into consideration additional physiology such as abnormal colonic motility, visceral hypersensitivity, low-grade inflammation, and alterations in gut microbiota. In gaining an appreciation for additional factors that play a role in diverticular disease, this expands our therapeutic options. Keeley and all found higher density of lymph node aggregates in macroscopically disease-free portions of colonic mucosa in subjects with versus without diverticulosis. Flok and all found abnormal pathology in random biopsies, with most demonstrating a lymphocyte infiltrate without overt colitis. Horgan and all um, looked at 930 patients undergoing surgery for SUD. There was chronic inflammation in and around the diverticula. The extent of the inflammation did not correlate well with symptom severity. Intestinal microbiota may be another contributing factor to chronic inflammation. Fecal stasis may lead to chronic dysbiosis, in turn promoting formation of abnormal metabolites leading to long-standing inflammation. Rifaximin, a sem semi-synthetic antibiotic, may reduce attacks of recurrent diverticulitis, and fiber can modulate gut microbial composition. Visceral hypersensitivity is also believed to play a role in chronic diverticulitis as in IBS. Patients with SUD demonstrated a heightened pain perception in the sigmoid colon and unaffected rectum when compared to controls. Recent studies suggest this hypersensitivity may be related to increased neuropeptides and alterations in enteric innervation in patients with diverticular disease a post-inflammation consequence after acute diverticulitis. The previous irregular motility thought to cause the diverticula may be involved in the resulting pain and constipation some patients see. Diverticulitis cases are 4.6 times more likely to receive an IBS diagnosis over a nine-year follow-up period. Appreciation of the possible role of inflammation and microbiota may extend our therapeutic options. There are several studies looking at the role of 5-ASA mesalamine and most show some improvement in symptoms and prevention of recurrence. The PREVENT-2 trial did not meet its goal of reducing acute attacks in a two-year period. However, they did not look at the impact of more of the chronic symptoms. Bianchi and all did a meta-analysis of four trials and calculated a number needed to treat of three for rifaximin versus placebo to achieve symptom relief and 59 to avoid a diverticular attack. Additional studies are definitely needed. Studies have looked at different probiotics, lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and BSL number three. There have been no difference in remission rates, but symptom scores for constipation, pain, and bloating were lower. In conclusion, I ask you to consider alternative etiologies of diverticulitis, which then inform alternate treatment options. 
Decision for surgery should not be automatic and patient factors should be weighed heavily. Diverticulitis may be more complex than we originally thought. In the beginning, we focused on anatomical etiologies. We now recognize inflammation, microbiome shifts, visceral hypersensitivity, and abnormal motility as additional etiologies. More research is definitely needed. One day, we may even think of diverticular disease, like we now think of peptic ulcer disease. Thank you very much for the opportunity.